there's, there's some of you work on galaxies or you know, active galaxies. So um, I'm going to I'm, I'm I'm a stellar astronomer, but I kind of look, most of my objects are bright enough that I can see them in other galaxies, nearby galaxies. Um, so I'm really going to focus on. So there's you know we we know there's a clean fairly clean break between stars at the low mass end, stars and brown dwarfs, about eighty something Jupiter masses. Um, Below which you know, don't get any UV generation, but the but the, the 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 question I'm going to propose really is whether there's a there's a physical limit to how massive normal stars can get, um, and and I would say the the the, the headline is that um, there probably isn't a physical limit, but there's probably a, a real world limit due to competition gas uh, in a in a dead star formation. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm going to really talk about uh, how massive the massive stars get, um, and a little bit about why we, initially why we care, but also where they are. And in fact, this is a nearby galaxy that's got quite a few of them uh, that we can resolve. And that's the challenge we have as we go far far away that you get you, know, you have fuzzy blobs and you can't really tell what's what. Um, got it right. So. It's not working. Okay. Yeah. So, oh, yeah. So I'm going to really got a few kind of general overview about why, why we might be interested in this. A little bit of history. There's some stories here about what we must be wary of some planes in the past, um, and then evidence for a certain limit, and then why not, not might not be the might not be true, and then binaries are always a challenge and. Implications should should such things exist more more generally. Uh, so in terms of names, so we have low mass. I, I when I give my undergraduate courses, I do very low mass, low mass, high intermediate mass, high mass. And high mass is typically above about eight things that end up with an iron core that blows up. Um, but if we kind of borrow from kind of the nomenclature of very metal poor objects, yeah, you know, in principle, you could be some crazy mass stars out, out there, which you know, which we which may exist, may not exist, you know, um, but, you know, so, so I would say a conventional massive star would be of order tens of solar masses. And the question is, do they go beyond tens in 200s or, or more? Uh, so in terms of motivation, well, you know, I would say we, we have some idea about the origins of type 1As. Um, conventional core collapse supernovae, um, you know, a, a bog standard core collapse supernova would be a star of 10, 20 solar masses that ends with a, a type 2 supernova and produces a neutron star remnant. Uh, some higher mass ones may or may not produce this collapse to black holes. Uh, but there's exotic things that theorists like to imagine might exist in the but exclusive to the regime of, of very massive stars, way, way above 100 solar masses. So, you know, if, if there's such stars don't exist, then that, that route isn't, isn't out there as an option. And of course, there's a connection to some degree with uh, sort of the LIGO of black holes, which are relatively massive um, and straddle this kind of challenging domain of, you know, where we wouldn't expect single stars or individual stars to evolve through. Um, and then if we look out, so again, if, we're, if, if there's some galactic astronomers there, and you look at star formation of the galaxies, uh, if you can resolve the clumps of star formation, you tend to have this unresolved um, clusters often. And this, uh, this is near this is near like galaxies where we can resolve compact, very compact clusters or massive clusters, uh, sort of separations of, of tens of parsec. Uh, with lens, Irish, gal Irish galaxies, we can do something similar in terms of looking at clumps of star formation. But you are looking at an unresolved population. So the question is, you know, when people model those things, because there's lots of population synthesis done, you want to know, okay, up to what limits should we assume such things exist and typically historically it's been of order 100 solar masses um uh, but then you know when you when you do some um rest frame uv in this case uh, ground-based optical of of things which at once for a time were hybrid shift uh, two was once hybrid shift um you see in things in the spectra of these things and people now papers saying oh you know maybe that's evidence for some extremely massive stellar population um so so we'll, we'll come back to that kind of spectral range later on where we can resolve stars and not rely on some indirect evidence. 
OK, so before we want to think about where might they be, let's start where, where we think they probably don't exist. Yeah. Um, so if we look at the young star from regions of the Milky Way, the nearest massive star nursery, some of you are working on, is, is the Orion Nebula cluster. Uh, why do I think that's probably a bad place to look? Well, because we can look at everything very accurately, and it's it's a pretty modest star from region in the grand scheme of things, and it's got stars up to about 30 solar masses. Uh, the theta one C Orionis, which dominates the yeah, in the nebula, ionizing photons in the nebula. So Orion is, I would say, great for ma mass functions for the low mass stars. Terrible looking for things at the extreme end, just because it's not. There's only a couple of thousand solar masses to play with in total, and you just run out of the mass function at about thirty solar masses. So, so, so Orion is great in many regards, but just it's just too puny a star forming region. Uh, okay, let's think about other places in the Milky Way which have got a resolved stellar population, which are really massive and young. And so this is an example of a, of a really massive young star cluster called Western and One. Uh, it's probably, it probably started with us, probably got total stellar mass of order 100,000 stellar masses. That's quite impressive. But it, it's, it's, got, it's got evolved objects in it. You know, supergiants, red supergiants, small prey stars, all sorts of stuff. It's clearly too old. Is somewhere between five and ten million years old. Therefore, any really massive stars that, if they were, if they, if when it formed, were there, were have long since gone. As I'll show up shortly after. Basically, the lifetimes are between two and three million years for the most massive stars. So, if they were there, we we don't see them anymore. Well, there are neutron stars in there, but we don't know about any black holes. Okay, so that's that's a bad place to look. Okay, where about us now? Go into a bit of history about where people have looked before and made claims around the existence of supermassive stars, stars with masses of way about a thousand. And we have to be wary about these claims because it's what we found out later on. Um, okay, so for that, before we before I look at individual regions, um, I would say historically easy accessible. Um, uh, galaxies, um, which are not satellite galaxies, they're in these extremely wide orbits, uh, basically kind of comet-like orbits around the Milky Way by the margin of clouds. Uh, and way back when Priest did a survey with a Radcliffe telescope in, in South Africa, produced a catalog of bright stars in the clouds. So there was objects run at R1 through 50 in the small clouds, and then 51 through 58 in the large clouds as well bright stars, and most of them probably are bright stars. But one of them um, has, is, is somewhat notorious for having this kind of history about claims and counterclaims about its existence. So this is the entire the LMC. Here you can see the bar, the Aradus or Tarantula, off away from the, away from the bar. It's because it's the brightest stage two region in the, in the local group. But well, the sky is about as big as the Orion Nebula cluster, um, but it's 100 times further away, so it's 100 times bigger. Uh, and about a thousand times more ionizing output than the line. So I would say Orion is fantastic for near nearby detail stuff, but on the grand scheme of things, I mean, even Theta Doradus isn't, isn't impressive on galaxy scales, but it's the nearest resolved impressive supergiant H2 region. Uh, if you zoom in on the tarantula, uh, there's a kind of a central ionizing region. Let you see it's an NGC number. If we zoom in on that, the center of that, in the central ionizing region, there's lots of stars, and this, this region called R136. I'm going, to, I'm going to talk quite a lot about R136. So just to give you some sense, it's a it's 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 one of these um Radcliffe numbers. So it's, it was once thought to be a really bright star. Um and if we go back to the early 80s, quite a long way back now, this this was the you know, this was the best quality observations around 1980 that we could do of R136. It, it was had, had component A, B, and C. Uh, and component A, you can see, is really bright. This was from the ESO 3.6 meter telescope. And when the first, I would say, well, when I, IUE in the ultraviolet was able to take a few reasonably high quality observations in the ultraviolet, the IUE was pointed in the early 1980s on this object and the spectrum just looked looked a bit like a hot star and so there were claims to saying oh it's one hot star but it's a really bright hot star therefore you know it's got a mass of several thousand solar masses 
uh, with, within a couple of years, uh, Weigelt, um was able to basically establish that no, 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 it's not one object, it's there's a whole, there's a, several objects in there, about eight. And so a component, so this is R136A, and then component one is the brightest, and two, and so on, with a eight components that were resolved. And then once you have, like, once you have corrected fission on Hubble, it's like, sure, it's a cluster. Um, so this was this was a state of the art in 1980, 1985, state of the art, um, spectral imaging. Um, this is probably a state of the art now because this is um, news, narrow field mode, high resolution imaging. So, so you get a spectrum, not only do you get a pretty picture, well, you get a spectrum of every saxel in there at pretty high angular resolution. And um, hobble like, if not a little bit better. Okay. So, so, um, so that that claim of a 2000 solar mass star in a nearby galaxy soon vanished, and therefore people have been very wary about making claims about such some, such such you know large values ever since. Um, so, how do you get masses? Ideally, you want a binary, but there are very few binaries that are put by high masses. I'll show a couple of examples today, but in general, you kind of reliant on how luminous a star is, and then assuming some mass the mass relation to infer a mass. So you need a luminosity, but to get a luminosity for stars like the sun, well, it's relatively straightforward. You can know how far away they are because it's all, all the actions in the optical. If you're looking at cool stars, all the actions in the infrared, you're looking at basically an A star, a little bit of the AUV, that's okay. We can do that from the ground. We look at really hot things. This cartoon from Peter Conti from a long time ago essentially shows that really hot things of course, your the UV opticals in the Rayleigh genes tail of the distribution, all the actions in the extreme UV. Um, but of course, that's inaccessible except for very nearby objects because of pesky inter interstellar hydrogen, which absorbs all those ionizing photons. So you kind of rely on models. And the trouble is, these three objects from the Rayleigh genes tail look the same, but you've got quite different beasts that are producing the ionizing photons. And you need reliable models to understand, to interpret the observations to go what the luminosity is. And that's where I think there's been work in the last few decades on these really hot massive stars when in the past uh, 25 years ago, I, I was saying these stars are not crazy mass, high mass, but now I'd argue that they're higher. Okay, so that was this sort of now having introduced the fact that there's there's potential really massive stars out there and you have to be really careful about you know is it a cluster or a star um so if we go back to um the early years of this uh, century um you know what what evidence was there for and against both ob and observational and theoretical for and against maybe a physical limit above which we don't think stars can exist or form conventional stars so if we take the case of um so not only is there are these young star clusters in the clouds, but there also are these young star clusters in the galactic center, the arches and the quintuplet, the arches is the younger of the, of the three, is also one at the uh, close to Sagittarius A star. But you know, within this, I would say in the 2000s, we were developing using, using Hubble and ground-based telescopes to obtain high spatial resolution imaging and some degree of spectroscopy of individual stars in these young regions. Um, so this was some work from Don Feiger in the early 2000s, where using just using NICMOS, so using just photometry, and then converting that photometry to uh, brightness, and then assuming something about the properties and inferring a mass from that. So it's really tough to do, but he, he, it went to nature, so it must be true. Um, uh, he, he basically observed the brightest stars in, in the Arches cluster, in the galactic center, and went, hold on a minute, we, we start running out of stars above 100 and something solar masses. Um, so this is with a star, Sol Peter slope. You'd say, well, there should be lots of stars down there which we're not seeing. Um, and so it was, I would say, in 2005, you'd say, oh, that sounds like pretty compelling evidence that there's a limit at 100 and something solar masses. What the reason is, we don't know. But that seems to be, you know, from that plot, you go, that looks pretty, pretty compelling. Uh, and so you kind of go, okay, what well, the theory, what well, the theory tell us? Well, if you look at the standard study version textbook, 
Um, you kind of think, well, here's our mass, and here's our luminosity, and with us, with our canonical L goes with M to some power, about three, three and a half, depending on what your mass domain is. You kind of go, ah, oh, why aren't the stars more than 200? Well, because they hit the energy limit. Yeah. Now, so if if this was true, and if this was true, that's the end of the talk. It's a very short seminar, isn't it? Yeah, but there's more. Um, both on the observational side and the theoretical side. Um, yeah. So if it was true that there's a limit at 100, 150, they're not, you know, they're basically we're, we're very much in the in the standards iron core collapse, supernova territory, and all those exotic things basically can't exist or can't exist in the present universe with something like solar composition. Okay, let's go back to that um, Eddington limit issue. So this is now taking the Geneva model, the one actually that uh, Mont Medea's textbook, Medea was the original author of this, of this thing, so he knew what he was doing. Um, this is the Eddington limit. Uh, this is our 10 to the 3 L goes with M cubed for main sequence stars. But the reality is that that slope changes in different mass domains. And if you do calculations up to hundreds of solar masses, actually what turns out is that the, the, the zero H main sequence doesn't do this, it basically turns over. So the models predict that the really high mass stars, the slope in the L to M relationship is much, much flatter. In fact, the asympt asymptotic value is m equals one, m to the one. Um, and so if we think about the Eddington parameter, this ratio between, which is proportional to luminosity to mass, you know, our, our, you know, our stars in Orion have a very small Eddington parameter of, you know, uh, 100 or something. But these really massive ones do, don't quite reach the Eddington limit, but they're quite close to it, which means I would say that they expect to have quite strong winds on the main sequence. So maybe not, wouldn't really call them Einstein, call them something else. Of course, another another implication of that is that if you now think about the mass lifetime, yes, you know, you'll think about your fuel fuel supply and the rate which you're getting through that fuel. You know, for it's a very steep function of, of mass for low mass stars, but of course, as you is 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 this thing tends towards L goes with m to the power one in the asymptote. It becomes mass independent. Yeah, so actually, for a for a typical O star, yes, it's still quite a steep function of of, um, of mass. But in the really high mass stars, it becomes almost mass independent. Because if it didn't do that, you'd have a lifetime of second or you know, something in the extreme. Yeah, but the, but the so the shortest lifetime of the most massive stars is a, a few million years. Which is why you need to find clusters or stars in regions younger than them. So that was kind of from theory, which we can always not trust entirely. How about observations? So this is again another young star cluster in the Milky Way, MC Day 603, got some dust towards it, but we can observe it quite well. Um, and so a former, a former postdoc of mine, um, Oli Schnur, used Hubble to um, to observe the central stars in that star cluster. It's a little bit like the one in the, in the LMC, but a little bit less massive. And and so he established dynamical masses of the of of the primary of, of one of these components and with bigger certainties established there's a there's a hundred and a ninety solar mass ish stars in a four day orbit. So you might go, well that's not that much of a hundred. But it certainly shows that such stars exist as, binar as binaries with masses in the ballpark of 100 stellar masses. Um, so, you know, this is the Klipschen system. So, again, we're not reliant on models that we don't trust for this. It's reasonably robust. This is the Klipschen binary system. Um, okay. So, so I would say I've, there I've tried to show that there's kind of a sort of a, a sense that there may be a real limit. But actually, that does 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 um, theoretical and observational things are a little bit fuzzier, maybe than you might have thought a couple of decades ago. Okay, so I'll come back to this um, this LMC dense star cluster, uh, thirty six. So we had the three components A, B, and C. That was nineteen eighty. This is now a uh, recent uh, sphere, a uh, PLT sphere, K band observations. 
So basically, this is the cluster here, and these are just a couple of bright stars, uh, B and C for A. This is clearly a star cluster, uh, where the separation between the brightest things are small, you know, of order of 10 to the last second, uh, which was challenging in the pre Hubble era, but is, I would say, now very doable with, with, with kind of Hubble web and ground based AO facilities. Okay. And then this is, uh, so that was a K band image, which allows us to get photometry, which is very important. Optical photometry is there's some variable for extinction, which is hard to quantify very accurately. But the K band photometry is robust, which means you know how bright the star is. Next thing to know how hot the star is to work out its velocity. And for that, you need spectroscopy. So this is, this is now again a Hubble uh, with big three, micro camera three image of that central region. Uh, and superimposed on that, uh, these these lines are basically slits. So uh, Hubble doesn't have an IFU, but I did the next best thing, which is to set this slit across the cluster to get spatial resolved spectroscopy of the brightest 50 or so stars, um, UV and optical, and then a student in Amsterdam, so a brands, and is, is used the UV optical data to analyze the stars to derive temperatures and velocities. And so the color here are basically the most massive ones we raised. Um, and the and the least massive ones, um, which are these kind of yellowy color, uh, are, all, are still as ma massive, if not more so, than the star in the center of blue line. Um, so the analysis that we did, we can then work out the the velocity, and then compare them to models to work out estimates of the masses. And so if we do that, so this is this is now the color map design, which is a diagram of, of that central cluster using the best models we have available right now. So the, the, we find lots of stars in that kind of 20 to 100 star mass domain. And then we find uh, a few above 100, and then a few, if you believe the future models, above 200. And so these three so component A1, A2, A3, uh, based on the models, which we have to be wary of being reliable in this domain, you would then say that the evolutionary models would claim current masses and initial masses in the sort of 200 to 300 solar mass domain. So quite, not, not 2000, but certainly comfortably above the 100 limit that might have been thought to be the case from that work from Tiger for the Archers. So, so a couple hundred solar masses. Um, but, um, but as we, if we think about, um, you know, this, these things are still 50 kiloparsec away. And so even with the fancy resolution that we can obtain from the ground or from Hubble, we have to be wary about multiplicity. Yeah, when that first observation with IUE was taken of our 36 a you go, it looks like an O star, therefore it's one thing. We have to be very wary about what we can resolve and what we can't resolve. And I think a good, a good word of caution is, is in the Orion trapezium cluster, where if you look at every you know, C21C, C21D, C21A, C21B, you know, there's binaries here, binaries here, and there's pairs of binaries here. So binaries everywhere amongst massive stars. So if you're really wary about going, well, can this be a binary or multiple system? Uh, because young massive stars do love company. And indeed, when people look at statistics on massive stars in the in galactic star clusters, and in the LMC, which is actually in the tarantula region, we find basically that most of them either are uh, in binaries now, or, um, or essentially, if they're, in, if they're single, they're mo you know, few of them are far enough apart from each other not to interact through new evolution. So some binary evolution will happen for a majority of massive stars. So what can we do about the uh, you know, possibility of these things being not even just a single object, but maybe even just a tight, really tight bound cluster of, of normal stars. Now, as I mentioned, these, these really massive stars, if they exist, are very close to the edge of the limits, and if so, they have very strong winds. And so actually the spectra don't look like normal low-star spectra with absorption lines. They have emission lines that look like what we call a bit like a Warfrey emission like star because of their strong winds. So if we take a known system in the same cluster, which is a binary system of a couple of low stars, and say, so, well, maybe you can have lots of those things in a really, really tight bound cluster somehow, in a short time. 
you know, the, the, these are normal absorption myelostars, so just putting lots of them together doesn't work. So you can't just add in lots and lots of old O-stars because the spectra look like quite different. Something else is going on. Um, so if we can't resolve them and the spectra look different, then, okay, what else can we do? Then we want to look for the Doppler shifts. We want to basically look for evidence that there's some, uh, you know, is, are these things binaries? So, so the, the easiest thing to do is to, is to monitor these things in, um, in uh, the optical infrared and to look for some Doppler shifts. It's hard with emission line stars, but it's still doable. Um, that, 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 that binary system in the other galactic cluster were emission line stars too, because they're very massive. And you could see the Doppler shifts of the emission lines as well as if you get any absorption. So we've looked for very short, you know, over quite intensive period and found there's nothing in the in any of these very very, very bright objects in the, in the core of that star cluster. Doesn't mean they're not there, but they don't have to be, you know, they don't have to be doing this rather than this uh, to um, to avoid detection through. So you can kind of say, well, probably not short period, really short period systems. Uh, what about longer periods where you didn't do the monitoring, of, of, you know, in a search in a whole lot of hundred days? Uh, so this is this motivated a study that I was involved with with uh, Thomas Lennar, who's used we use this over a different sampling period to look for Doppler shifts. Uh, over periods of weeks to months, uh, and this this figure from his recent paper for the for these four for the three bright things right in that central cluster and this other object which is suspected to be a binary system. This is now the period on the x-axis, and then the potential mass, the likelihood of the potential mass at the secondary. So for the for these three compact objects, for these com objects in the core of that cluster. We have a low likelihood of them be having periods of order tens of days, hundreds of days, because we, we have seen it in the data set we got with this. Uh, for C, quite different. There's a high likelihood of it being having periods of, of, of order 10 to a two, 10 to three days. And that's one that I'll come back to as basically one that looks really different in x rays. So we use x rays as well to get information on binarity. Um, so, so from the Doppler shifts, short, really short period, longer period. These three bright things in that central cluster look like they, they're not really short period systems. So, so maybe they've got longer periods. So how, we want to say once, what techniques can we use to try and look for longer period systems? Um, well, this is just some recent. Uh, so Eris is the late, one of the latest high res uh, IFUs basically on, on the VLT. And so th these things, these two objects are you know, a, a tenth of an arc second apart. This is this is a fairly clean separation now with data like Eris, where we can, we can nicely resolve these things. Um, ELT should go non dimensional better. They're probably not just not not quite too bright to be observed with ELT, but you can certainly should be able to get an augmented higher resolution whenever it comes online. Okay, so. So standard Doppler shifts, we've not seen anything from the ground or from the, the uh, from HST. Okay, what about X-rays? And I think X-rays is a bit odd to be thinking about massive stars. Well, it turns out that massive stars, I mean, they have strong winds and these things have strong winds, the emission lines. If you have two close, close enough together, what each of them have intrinsically some X-ray output because the winds are, are, have shocks, self-shocks within them. But if you have two windy things quite close together, particularly at certain periods, the winds smash into each other and you get what we call a colliding wind system. And that's X-ray bright. So, and this can, we can detect that over periods of not of tens of days, a hundred days, but maybe if you orbit a thousand of days, because if a power enough, power enough winds, you would have an enhancement in the X-ray output. So, so if you have, you know, pairs of similar mass objects, colliding winds, you'd expect them to be really bright. Um, so this led on to a study that I did with uh, some Chandra observations uh, of this whole region. So this is the, this is the, so I'm now going to spend five minutes or so on this Chandra data set that we we got of the tarantula, the whole tarantula, or say the Radius region. So that's the central cluster. Uh, there's lots of diffuse emission. This is some uh, pulsar down here. Uh, this is all LMC down to the lower, down to the, up to the right. This is this Erosita 
observations of the entire LMC. This is just the tarantula region. Um, so lots of diffuse emission, but we're not interested really in diffuse emission, we're interested, interested in point source emission. And this is now, so this, this was a two megasecond sort of um, pre X ray data set over a couple of years that uh, we obtained with, with Lisa Townsley. And so there's basically lots and lots of sources. And if we zoom in on now into the center of that, um, I'm now going to switch between an optical view of that cluster. This is a cluster. Um, so this is A, cluster, uh, which is A. This is B and C on that scale there. This is another object that we're, we're going to mention in a minute. Now it's 34, it's called. So this is an optical HST um, WFC3 image of that region. And now, shift to the x-ray view of that central region what do you see well you see the central cost is there but it's kind of not as bright as you might think it should be c was the one that had evidence for the doppler shifts from the this data set so you kind of go yeah that's, that's uh, x-ray bright and doppler shifts binary and this the brightest thing of all here is this fairly innocuous star i'll go back to the optical view in a minute that is really x-ray bright so we can we can look at that one a bit more to go well, what's going on here that isn't going on in the central cluster and maybe going on to a less degree in this other object here. So I go back to the optical to remind you that that's a cluster. This was the X-ray brightish thing, and that's really X-ray bright thing. This this object actually turned out was the one where Hubble had its correction vision, vision corrected with you know CoStar. The first thing they looked at to make sure it's working was that. Because it's a bright thing in a nearby galaxy. Yeah. Anyway, so optical cluster, lots of stars everywhere. Um, but that's modestly bright. This is pretty bright, and that's really bright. So what's going on here? Well, it turns out because we had 600 days of data, we could basically find it had a period of 155 days. So what's that five months period where it basically goes along and it rises in brightness and then there's an eclipse and x-rays and then it recovers uh, every 155 days soft component and a very hard component with a with the old 6.7 kb iron feature um so classic colliding wind system so when we, we then got to go i got i got a student student to work on some optical data i got for the system with with the to uves uh, and we basically established that it's a pair of really massive stars, 150-ish, primary and secondary, both emission line stars, uh, quite eccentric, because you can see that basically the X-ray, if it was not if it was zero, it would be flat. But because you have time when, they, when the stars are close, you get to get advanced emission, except when there's some eclipse in the, the X-rays. So this, this is characteristic of Eccentric kind of binaries, Itikar, and other cases in the Milky Way. So the similar, similar mass stars, but they're more evolved. But this is even brighter in, in the maximum than Itikar, which is one of the brightest X-ray sources in the Milky Way. So this is to me is a prototype of a very massive colliding wind binary system. Um, but but that's what you get from one binary system. If there were such systems in here, that would be way brighter. Yeah, because that's one, one system. This is a whole cluster of stars. And if any of them were like this, it would be much, much, much brighter. So we so that suggests to me that um, when we look at the X-ray data combined with the optical and infrared data in that central region, this is a cluster, this is B and C, B space, C is brightish, it's the region I'm looking at here, then actually. How bright are the X rays from that cluster compared to what you might expect normal stars, non binaries, or non interacting binaries to do? This is this relationship between this is now luminosity against X ray output. Normal massive stars sit around about 10 to minus 7 LX compared to L mol. So, and so, magnetic force is way above that, you know, a couple of a hundred higher because it's a climbing wind system, as is C to a lesser degree, but, but the central cluster. It's kind of what you expect with now any body wind system in there form. So X-rays help to go, yeah, if, the, if there's two equal mass things, we should see it. And that's the separation is so wide, but then it's such a dense region that they might get split up because of the um, 
things to be overcrowded in this market. So that to me suggests that you know, if there's binaries, there's there's a major major there's a primary and a puny secondary that doesn't really play a role in terms of what we when we analyze the data. Right. So in my remaining five minutes or so, yeah, uh, my sense is that there are stars way above 100 star masses. So they therefore, okay, what will be the implications of the existence of such stars? Um, well, we had this, this thing I showed earlier, which is different metallicities. Basically, everything's in the iron four collapse supernova domain. But if we can uh, have stars in the 200, 250, the main, this is kind of this is where the stars sit here. Then it does open a possibility of uh, the for metal core massive, really massive stars, these pair stability or pair production supernovae, which basically blow themselves apart. So it's not saying they exist, it's just we're not ruling them out. Yeah, there's a possibility for such things. So the theory is that we still play around with such potential systems, and that's kind of relevant to these um, LIGO black holes. Um, just going back to Melnick 34 again, in the context of LIGO black holes, normally you find the spiral of two massive black holes and then you rely on some population analysis to go, what kind of thing did that come from? Yeah, that's how it works, isn't it? Um, so what we did in reverse actually was saying, okay, we now know there's a very massive system in the LMC with these orbital properties. What's its future evolution going to be? And this might give you some weather of caution when it comes to interpreting those popular synthesis models that says, oh yeah, this black hole binary came from this system. So, so we basically run it through all the various um, standard channels. So given, given, where it's, given we know it's now a million year old, very massive binary system, main sequence massive binary system, what might be its fate? Well, it could be, it could be, it could be a merger and a, a pair production supernova, or there could be a, Black, it could be a black hole, black hole merger eventually after two gig years. Yeah. Um, or it could be some weird sort of um, form thick of object, or it could be a wide black hole binary that never merges on the whole time, or it could be, you know, so there's lots of possibilities. Yeah. Which basically means we don't really know about the evolution of these massive stars well enough to know what prediction there is about what they would what their fate would be. So, so always take with a pinch of salt the fact that, oh, if we found this, therefore it came from this system, because it's clearly that more or less anything's possible. Yeah. Um, so thinking less about LIGO, black hole binary, but more about star forming regions, rich star forming regions like this tarantula region in the LMC, the total output 10 to the 52 ionizing photons per second. So it's a big region. You know, a couple of hundred parsec, lots of iron photo, a thousand times that of Orion. If we since we've now done a census of all, all the massive stars in that region, um, and we worked out the properties, and therefore then you, you work out what the ionizing outputs are from each star of those thousand stars, it turns out that half of them, so this is the total output in ionizing photons from all the stars. This is how the number of stars going from the most impressive to the to the thousand most impressive objects. Half of the ionizing output of the whole tarantula comes about from around about 30 or 40 stars. So a few, like in the same way that in Orion, one star dominates the ionizing output. Here, a few dozen stars, even though there's thousands of OB stars in that region, have a major role to play in the total ionizing budget, uh, which is relevant to how massive a star we need to think about in population synthesis terms. Because the most massive stars have you know, something like 30 times the ionizing output of the theta 1c in the dominant object in the Orion, in the Orion cluster. Um, so so we, we're limited to you know very few objects in the near in the resolved universe, nearby universe that we can actually look at individual stars and go, you know, is this a very massive star or not? In general, looking at unresolved clusters. So is there a signature of the presence of such very massive stars in the spectra of young unresolved star clusters or stellar populations. So if you now just focus on that central parsec of that uh, region, RSB6, because I had individual spectroscopy of all the stars, I did the cheapest thing, which is just to say, okay, I'm gonna look at, integrate all the spectrum of everything, and that produces this white line here in the ultraviolet. Yes, everything produces a white spectrum. Um, 
And then it's okay, now separate into O stars, which is makes up two thirds of the phi of the continuum flux. And that's what's in green. And then I looked at the half dozen things that are, I, we analyze and refer to be 100 plus sub analysis. And there's basically, you know, there's, and I think like 80 of them in total, but the most is the to resolve things. So like 70 normal O stars and about half a dozen really massive things in that HR diagram. And so they all look kind of similar in some regards, except for this 1640 mission line, which is uniquely coming from the very massive stars because they're so high up in the velocity, but they're so high up in their Eddington parameter that they have a really strong wind. And this is a wind feature, the combination line of helium. Whereas the, the even this, this is a very young region. Yeah, so normally this line might be coming from a classical world ray, which are evolved stars, evolved massive stars, but they don't come in until about three or four or five million years. So it's so young enough, it's only two million years old at most. Therefore, this is these are the main sequence of very massive stars producing this 1640 emission. So in, in such a young cluster, yeah, I, would, I would say this is a telltale sign of the presence of very massive stars if it's as young as this cluster is. Um, if we look on a, on, a, on a bigger scale, because that's just a cluster which is a parsec in size, if we now look on a bigger scale and now looking at the central ionizing source of the tarantula, um, we, we, I got some, uh, some MUSE data. And so actually the MUSE data of that, of that region looked at something of all the spaxels in the optical, gives you a very strong, very high ionization nebula. So this is the O3 doublet. Um, strong H alpha, strong H beta. You see some Wolf Ray features because there are some classical Wolf Ray stars in that region. This is now 30 by 30 parsec. This sits very much amongst the Green P galaxies, if you know about Green P galaxies and the DPT diagram. Um, but there's been a recent uh, UV, UV survey of produ producing high resolution UV spectra of OB stars in the, in the LMC and the SMC. So because I know the stellar content of this very well from the news data, I was able to basically either use the UV data of individual stars that have been observed in Hubble, or if I hadn't been observed in Hubble, I used the template from this thing called the Ulysses survey. Um, and so I was able to produce what I would say is a reasonable estimate of the empirical integrated spectrum of that entire region, not just the cluster, but the entire star forming region. And then I had basically several hundred stars, the integrated UV spectrum here of that entire region, Mostly OB stars, but I, mean, I get a mixture of classical wolf ray and these very massive stars, very massive stars, the ones in red here. So something like the other half of the U of a 1640 line comes from classical wolf ray stars, and the under half comes from the very massive main sequence stars. So they're kind of both contribute. So for a, for a mixed age population, it's very hard to tell the difference between classical and very massive main sequence. Um, And then just for fun, I kind of went, okay, imagine this was what you would observe in an unresolved population. I then threw some of the most contemporary, you know, popular synthesis models at those. I would say they, they, the overall produce something that looks a little bit like it, but not good enough, I would say. Uh, it, it tells me then the, the populations, they, 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 they cut some corners around various aspects of uh, evolution or models for the stars. Um, this one did do a pretty good job, but but only at 2.2 million years population and not at 2.1 or 2.3. So this is its peak, which happened to coincide with that string of that line. So overall, I would say room for improvement on the population synthesis, because that's really what they're trying to do. Um, and then the final thing I did is I went, okay, let's now do the entire tarantula. How would it look? With a radius of 100 parsec, which is generally what you're doing, you know, that is unresolved regions of 100 parsec scale put your cost aperture over it, see what you get. And again, it looks a bit similar. It's about a factor of two brighter. So half the analysis UV, UV continues from here, the other half around here. In this case, I've just grouped together the wolf rays and the main sequence stars because it's very hard to know which, which, which classical wolf ray stars came from very massive compared to less massive stars. So I group them together. But overall, it's the other thing that dominates the integrated UV spectrum of that entire region. And similar challenges with population synthesis. Um, so just in the last minute, these are resolved populations. 
if we now go back to this unresolved population of this of this starburst galaxy, this blue compact dwarf, there have been spectra taken in the ultraviolet of, of A1 in that galaxy. And it looks a bit like R136 of that 1640 mission. So again, they attribute that to be evidence for very massive stars in that in that galaxy, which may or may not be true. So by way of summary, this is what this is when I gave you context about what do I mean by different mass stars. Um, so I've got, I got I've got nothing to add about this territory, um, and um, and what we where we are currently is that I would say there is empirical evidence in favour of stars in the hundreds of solar masses. Um, is that a feasible limit? Probably not. It's just I suspect it's just a competition. These are very compact regions with lots of gas. And I think it's just a competition for gas amongst different protostars ends up with basically this stopping at a limit that's not physically imposed, but it's more just a practical one where you've got a finite amount of gas in a finite amount of space and a very rapid accretion of that gas onto the protostars. Um, so I'm going to leave it there. And there's various um, references if you are interested. So thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. Very interesting talk. So I, I was very much interested in the, the MIMS uh, integrated spectral attack. Yeah. Uh, what, what in particular, I was interested in nitrogen five line. Yeah. Uh, some, some of the uh, few things. The nitrogen five, 50, 60, 40. Yeah. yeah. So what, 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 is, what is the main source? Can you actually constrain the mass of the star? Which actually dominantly produce 9.5. So, so you can see here already that basically the uh, I grouped together all the OB stars. So I've got an individual inter spectrum of every 209 stars. So it's the hot, it's the early O stars, and it's also the very massive stars, which are also very hot, and also the WN flavor or Fred Castle stars. So all three contribute to it, um, which is dominant. Well, probably um. It, 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 it's basically it splits, I would say, in terms of its line flux between very early O's and these evolved or very or, or massive main sequence stars. So both contribute. So you can't you can't use um, nitrogen five twelve forty and say, oh, that's evidence for something else, something else. If it was present in an older population, it has to be the Wolfrayas because the O stars are part. I'm thinking in connection to the hydrogen galaxies. Oh, yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I would say, in general, I would say with a with a mixed age population, I would say it's generally going to be telling you it's it's most likely coming from uh, ongoing star formation and therefore dominated by the main sequence O stars and related objects. So. If the winds associated with the uh, very massive stars, what what sort of um, in terms of the overall feedback budget for a You're talking about ionizing or mechanical or chemical? Yeah, mechanical. Mechanical. Um, I would say that um, if it's a, if it's if it's a if we if it's a, the early earlier stages, it's probably the most important. The first couple of million years, I would say they play a major role in mechanical feedback because they have winds rather more powerful than the the O stars. So if we, if we exclude them. You are, you are underestimating the true mechanical feedback in the very early couple of million years. If 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 it's if you're now at maybe five million years or so, the dominant source would be the um, classical or phrase stars. If you look at an older population, again, the gas may have already gone by that point, but if it hasn't, um, the things that would dominate the mechanical feedback would probably be the red, would be red supergiants. Or, but to be honest, and then supernovae, really. But supernovae might not kick in as early as some people think they would. Oh, thanks for this great talk. Uh, I was wondering, you had different constraints. So the um, so one kind of constraint was spatial constraints, so you try to resolve the different Yeah, constraints. yeah. And then you have the timing constraints. For that's, the that's right. I was wondering what could actually combine the two, because um, if you have a, a very long period orbit, then you would probably have a, a wide binary that you could spectroscopically resolve. So, uh, they would be really wide to resolve. I mean, don't forget those those two bright sources. Well, they were ten to light second apart, but that's like five thousand AU. Okay. That's a, that's so that's you know I showed you this area data. 
but that's the that's less than 10 to the second, but at the 50 to the first second, that's you know that sounds a bit unique. Okay, so so the constraints don't touch. So so really you don't touch now. No. So there so there could there could be principle with these systems which have got really wide separations that you wouldn't get them from Doppler shifts or from X-rays and you couldn't resolve spatially. You might go, well, what about those? But I think the thing is it's such a dense cluster that if there were such really wide things, they would they, they would either get hardened or they get destroyed on during that formation. So I think there's probably reasons why we might think if such a really wide separation thing was at birth, there'd have been some impact on that wide separation through, you know, basically, you know, basically soft soft systems soften and hard systems harden, given the very dense environment that had to happen during the formation of this type of stuff. That's of course theory constraint. Well, I know. Well, yeah, I, don't, I like to avoid theory where possible, but sometimes one has to have some to think. Well, okay, what would be a possible scenario? But really, with with the with the observations we can do right now, we've done the best we can to try and test as much in that period space as possible. I think with with in principle with uh, ELT, we, we can clearly to do better, somewhat better on spatial resolution. Order magnitude. And so you're saying about the practical and the gas supply. Yeah. How big so does that have some sort of richer and the gas supply within the tumor? So I mean in general, um so so I didn't I've not got a shot, I'm not sure I've got the figure here, but um clearly early universe a lot more gas around. Uh, if I go back to, uh, I mean, I show this figure, which was this uh, this BPT diagram figure here. I think what I haven't done is I didn't show a corresponding one of essentially, you know, locally there's basically a size and star formation relationship we can think of, which is fairly fairly low in terms of low star formation per unit area. In general, as you go to higher redshift, you've got a lot of gas supply, you get a lot of these clumps of high redshift, which are forming a lot of stars in a very small region. Uh, Peter Gerard is actually, or the, the, this region itself, fits much closer to the higher redshift representative value than it does in the local universe. It's quite extreme locally, but it's, it's probably a bit more typical for high redshift. The main difference with high redshift, of course, is that you're looking at much more metal poor um, metallicity. Than you are here. This is only in our solar, which is which is quite high in rational things, you know. So a lot more metal poor star formation clear in the redshift five to ten. So actually, so that would be have a big impact. But in terms of the, the intensity of star formation, this is as close as you can get to a, a typical not star formation in a lensed redshift two galaxy. Same. So, 